uh, back this week uh, with a pretty interesting webinar about uh, how to machine tough materials or tough to cut materials using uh, eye machining uh, 2D, eye machining 3D, and HSR, HSM for roughing and pre roughing and finishing. Uh, from my experience of this webinar done yesterday, uh, I believe that this is going to be a slightly lengthy webinar, so we have to be prepared for it because yesterday it went to about 90 minutes and I expect the same thing to happen today or maybe slightly more. So it's a slightly lengthy webinar, so let's be prepared for it. And in between, if you hear me munching up some snacks, it's because it's already lunchtime in India and if it's getting if it gets delayed, I get hungry and then I have to put something in my stomach. All right. So and this session is going to be basically a combination of uh, showing you some slides, showing you paths, and it will keep juggling between paths and, and the slides. Okay. So uh, when people ask me, what do you do specially? when uh, you want to cut in coral, or when you want to cut titanium, or when you want to cut stainless steel with eye machining. And my answer is pretty simple to them. In a very uh, funny way, I tell them, look, you're driving a BMW automatic, and somebody gives you an Audi and says, drive this, you drive that, and then they ask you the question, how did you drive Audi? You were driving BMW. How did you drive Audi? What was the difference you found? Well, there can be subtle differences between those two experiences of driving, but with eye machining, most of the times you can be assured that you can drive on the road, you can drive very well on the road, provided certain things are taken care of. Now, these certain things can actually make a substantial difference to cutting uh, steel or cutting inconel. So, these are very important. You have to keep these things in mind. Other than that, in my honest opinion, there's not much of a difference in eye machining when you're cutting steel or when you're cutting in color. Okay? So what are the materials that are very difficult to cut? Titanium and the alloys of titanium. Hello guys, I think we have a small problem, so please wait a few seconds to fix it. Problem. Yes, Amod, you can uh, continue, please. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Uh, I don't know where I was, so let's start from the beginning. Exactly, uh, from this slide. Thank you. Okay. So let's look at the hard materials or difficult to cut materials. They're basically titanium, incono, stainless steel, stellite. Fast alloy, tungsten, and uh, the mold steels basically are used, which are 45 HRC pre hardened and beyond. So these are the difficult to cut materials or hard to cut materials. And uh, there are certain things that you need to do, which is slightly different from your regular cutting. For example, you're cutting aluminium, you're cutting uh, 
16 mm CR5, you're cutting 20 mm CR5, you're cutting ASI 1045 steel, uh, and all these category of materials when you cut, and when you cut these materials, there are certain things that you need to keep in your mind when you, when you start, or there are, there are preparations to be done when you, uh, when you cut these materials. And we're going to see basically those subtle differences which make a major impact when you're cutting the part in either in conol titanium or these type of materials. So why is it so difficult to cut these materials? First of all, let's understand the properties of these materials. First of all, they are high strength and corrosion resistance. For example, uh, I was looking at a picture. I, unfortunately, it's, a, uh, it's, it's not something that I can share, but I can tell you. Uh, let's make a drawing. I like to make drawings. If you look at the engine uh, of, uh, of an aircraft, right, something like this, and then there is a cone-like thing at the end, right, and you have got the blades up here and all the other assemblies. You will realize, if you analyze this engine, you will realize that if I split this engine into half, okay, if I put it in half, this portion of the engine is done using inconel components, whereas the other portion, the front portion, is done using titanium. The reason is because of this particular picture. The reason being that the strength of the material drops considerably when put to high temperatures. You look at Inconel, the nickel alloys, you, you realize that the strength almost remains constant and then drops a wee bit at high temperatures. Now here we are talking of temperatures ranging, ranging from 1,200 above, more than 1,200. Inconel performs extremely well even at these high temperatures. It retains its strength. And therefore, this part of the engine, which is the hot part of the engine, is made with Inconel components, whereas the front of them, are like the blades and other things, they're done using titanium. That's the main reason, first of all, why they are so difficult to cut. So they have high strength and corrosion resistant, age hardenable, and kernel if you keep for a lot of time, you try to give it for aging, it starts hardening by itself. High heat resistance and stability at high temperatures, poor thermal conductivity. Now these two, for example, poor thermal conductivity is the second biggest reason why it's so difficult to cut. In normal circumstances, when you're cutting uh, steel, you will expect that when the cut happens, the heat is taken out by the chip. And that is the reason you use air to blow the chip out of that cutting area so that the chip doesn't pass the uh, heat back to the workpiece or to the tool. However, in case of inconel, especially in case of inconel, the chip doesn't carry the heat. The heat is carried by the tool because neither does the chip carry the heat nor does the workpiece carry the heat. So the, there is heat generated, a lot of heat generated, and that is actually passed back on the tool. And therefore, you will see that when you're cutting inconel, the tool life is really very short. For example, in some of the experiments that we did, or some of the test cuts that we've done in India with Inconel, we've seen that a company like Kitscar, when they give the tool, their tool life is like about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. That's it for, for the particular part. And in such cases, you see later on, that we have pushed up the tool life to as much as 80 minutes. OK, so poor thermal conductivity, one of the reasons of failures of tool on inconel is because of this. Rapid work hardening tendency, again, this is the speciality of inconel. It, it generates, for example, if you take a cut and if you're going slow, okay, 
Now this is where eye machining starts making the difference. Generally, the amount kind of feed rates that the customer, the tool vendors suggest for titanium, titanium and chromium are very low. So they say go with a VC of 45 feed rate. The feed per tooth is like 0.1, and you end up with a feed feed rates of about 300 or 400. So what you're basically doing is you're trying to cut the part pretty slowly, but it is actually working against us. If you try to cut the part slowly, that means you're leaving the material for more longer time before the cutter comes back and engages again. When such thing happens, when things like this happen, you start work hardening. And once it hardens up, it's very difficult to cut the skin. You really have to get into the skin to make the next cut. And this is what eye machining comes up. Uh, rather, this is where eye machining comes up with a nice solution to be explained later. And because of all these, and because of the strength, uh, parts holding strength at high temperatures, the machine, the machinability of this part is really very poor. Okay. And today we are going to talk on how to overcome this last point, how to machine effectively. Okay. So, what are the challenges that we have in machining these parts? First of all. The biggest challenge that you have is the chip thickness variation. Why do I say chip thickness variation as one of the challenges? Because I'm assuming here that there is no eye machining. So you're going to have variable chip thickness, especially when you're cutting using the regular offset mechanism of cutting, which is very pro common and prominent with every CAM system. In such offset strategies, you know that you start with a thin chip and you go to thick chip when you're going, going into the corner. So the chip thickness variation itself is a major challenge when you're cutting tough parts because the stress that you, you induce when cutting steel, soft steel, with the chip thickness variation is not much. It's, it's pretty low. But the kind of stress that you put the tool on, mechanical as well as thermal stress, especially the thermal stress, when you're cutting with an offset strategy on internal or titanium is far greater than what you put in steel. What this basically does is these chip variation means there's a variation of load, there's a variation of thermal stress, there's a variation of mechanical stress on these tools. And these tools are able to perform only if there's a constant load in terms of mechanical and thermal load on the tool. Only then they come up to their life. Otherwise, their life dramatically dips. So, the first is how do we maintain constant chip thickness or constant chip load? That's the first challenge. Coupled with that is the high heat stress. How do we take this heat out of the machining zone? Toolware. Now, toolware has got its roots both in both in heat stress as well as chip thickness variation. Uh, materials like titanium and stainless steel, these are sticky materials. And they generally tend to stick to your edge of the tool if there is no proper lubrication. And once the built up edge starts coming up on the tool, your tool starts cracking easily. It starts chipping on the edge and once it's chipped, you, you don't lose time before the tool is broken. So, the tool wear and edge build up are two things. Again, they pose a great challenge to machinists worldwide. Low thermal conductivity, that means the, the entire stress of heat is on the tool. How do we overcome this? The deformation process from plastic to hard is very quick. So how do we maintain a uniform deformation uh, process so that you avoid work hardening when you're cutting, another challenge. And the most important of all, how do we get the right cutting conditions? Because I have seen uh, cutting tool vendors, they come up with some crazy uh, solutions. Let's say use the VC of this and an F set, and finally you realize that when you go to the machine, it's just not working. And then you start playing fiddling with the feed rates, you start changing the engagements, a lot of things, and in the end, it's a mess. 
So getting the right cutting condition itself is a major challenge. Okay. Right. Now, apart from the challenges that the material itself poses, there are several other influences or challenges that come up. First of all is the machine. I remember we went to a customer down somewhere in the southern part and somebody had told them because they were cutting a lot of titanium bars. They told them that you have to have a very powerful spindle. So they were looking forward for another machine where the cost of the machine was about three times their existing cost. But they were about to finalize it when uh, one of our cutting tool vendors took us into the account. And the first thing they told us was they showed us the cut, uh, titanium component and they asked us estimate the time and estimate the power requirement for the cutting this part. So with all our experience, we estimated the time. The customer was very happy with the time. He said, with this time, what is the power that you, you recommend? And we checked out the power. The spindle power was about 6 kilowatt, which was very well sitting within their machine parameters. So that was the first day when we were very unpopular with the machine to vendor because he lost the he did not get a machine because the customer said we are going to use our existing machines, we are going to change our programming system and we will cut titanium. So the first influence comes from the machine itself, the power available on the spindle, the spindle construction, gear driven or, sp or a direct spindle, the axis, how rigid and how stable they are and the overall stability of the machine itself not to mention the control because we tried cutting hard materials not it was not titanium and inconel it was hard steel on very old controllers and we realized that if there is no smoothing function is that or if the controller is not able to read or it doesn't have a good look ahead you generally uh, don't you're not able to cut the part more effectively the chances of failure increase because in hard materials, jerks can actually break the tool or chip the tool very easily. So the controller also plays a great role in the machine tool environment. That's, that's the first challenge from the machine. The other challenge comes from the tool itself. When you're cutting in kernel titanium or stainless steel, you must ensure that the grade of the tool is able to cut that material. What parameters? Let's leave it to eye machining. But the first thing is you need to understand whether the tool is able to cut. So the first question that I pose to the cutting tool vendor, you're suggesting this tool, tell me whether this can cut titanium or anchor. If he says yes, go ahead. If he says no, ask him to suggest another tool. Because again, this is uh, coming out from our own experience of doing parts. We did trials with Mazak in India on uh, SS uh, PH17-4. It's a pretty tough material to cut, about 50-52 HRC. And there were two tools that were uh, being checked on the machine. One was from Hanita and the other one was from Seco. Uh, the Seco looked very nice, golden color, and we were very impressed with the geometry. So we put that tool, and within three minutes, the tool was all gone. There was nothing remaining on the tool. Of course, the parameters were very high. Remember, a 52 HRC part on Mazak was being run on a level 8. So, Seiko 2, exactly the color that you're seeing on the screen, golden color, with a corner radius, I think it was 12 R2. In, in a matter of two minutes, the tool was all gone. The other tool was a bit ugly looking, but it was from Anita, Kena Metal, and we tried that. Conditions were same, level 8 turbo, it ran for 55 minutes, no problem. So it's very important, first of all, the geometry of the tool and the coating. These two must be in line with the requirements to cut enconol and to cut titanium or stainless steel. So unless and until the cutting vendor doesn't certify that this is 
a tool meant to cut this part, I would suggest you not to jump in and say we will use a tool. No, let, let the cutting tool vendors will be fine. Once you are done with the tool, the next one is the holder itself. Many times I've seen customers, oh, we use are a big no, capital N O, they're no, they're just no go. You can't use collets when you're using eye machining. Why? Because eye machining has got very high axial forces in, in, in and out of the spindle. The forces are very high. So depending on your helix angle of the tool, the tendency for the material to pull the tool out of the holding is extremely high. If you're holding on a collet, at the most, you hold one D or one times the diameter. That's very low for such high forces. You will see immediately that your tool is pulled out and you're going to have a catastrophic cut. Tool will go off. Not only will your tool go, but you will spoil your material. So the most important thing here from the tool side is the holding. You have to insist. I will use the word insist. You will have to insist on either using a hydro grip or a power chuck. Shrink fit is okay, but it's not, a, it's not something I would recommend. But hydro grip or power chuck are two things you must insist the customer to have before you even attempt to cut such materials. The other one is holding. Now, majority of the times, since you cut from block, you have got the option to hold the part in vice. In such cases, you will have to push the customer to use hydraulic wise. Please do not use mechanical wise. Mechanical wise is a big no when you're cutting such parts because, again, about, uh, it's about the forces involved. The another important thing is the two sides that are going to be held in the jaws when you're, when you're using a wise ensure that they have a parallelity, they are parallel by at least 50 microns, if not less. It needs to be 50 microns, that's the maximum, because I have seen in uh, some cases, even when you're holding with hydraulic wise, the, the two sides were not parallel, it was about like 0.1 or odd, it, the part was just pulled up, okay, because of the forces. So it's very important, if possible, get both the sides ground before you go into holding the part in the wise. So use hydraulic wise or systems from Shunk for holding the uh, uh, part of the Kurt, sorry not Shunk, Kurt. From Kurt, the wise is where from Kurt, right. So it's very important, hydro, hydraulic wises. The third and uh, the fourth most important thing, and this actually makes a lot of difference to your cutting, is the fluid. When you're cutting in kernel, when you're cutting stainless steel or when you're cutting titanium, your cutting fluid, the composition of the fluid is very important. I will give you a general guideline, but again, you'll have to go back to your customer and ask them, please call the cutting tool guys and check with them the concentration of the cutting oil in your tank. Because many times I've seen customers they, they don't give much importance to the concentration in the, in the tank. This is good for steel and aluminium, no problem. But when you're cutting these materials, that, that concentration, even the percentage here and there, could make a major difference to your tool life. Okay? So I'm going to give you a general guideline later on what concentration to use. Okay, so I don't really have to teach you eye machining. All of you already know about eye machining. It's a revolutionary product. Uh, you can cut fast, productivity is up, you can have time savings of 70% and more. So I don't need to delve on these slides because these are slides that you, you show to your customer and you know them by heart. And you also know what is eye machining. I don't need to explain because this is what I was explaining yesterday. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to spend time on this. But where I want to spend time is here. Because these are some of the things your customer is bound to ask. When, when, uh, when, uh, when we cut inconel, uh, sorry, when we cut titanium, 
the recommended cutting speed was 60 and the I machining came up with about 175. That was three times. So the customer immediately asked, what is the what is the philosophy of generating such a high cutting speed? The philosophy of generating a very high cutting speed comes from this diagram of Solomon's curve. Okay? Solomon's curve is simple. What it says is that as you increase your cutting speed, your temperature increases. But as you go beyond a certain value, your, your temperature actually starts dropping down. You're talking of BCs of five to ten times more than the conventional cutting speed, the temperature starts dropping. Now this looks very fine. The customer gets very impressed. Oh, this is beautiful. So you use Solomon's curve. So it starts dropping. The temperature starts dropping very, very fine. If the customer is a little bit more uh, curious, he's going to ask, Tell me why does the temperature drop when you increase the VC? Now, many times I, I got away from the situation by explaining to them, look, I'm not so long. I'm not a scientist. I realize what is happening at the end. Unless Nikki explains why the temperature drops. And that is because of these process. It's called the temperature balance process. Well, what happens part in the very first contact, because of the high BC, the temperature of the cutting edge rises. Okay, the contact temperature rises. Once the temperature rises, the material moves into a transition from solid to plastic phase. It becomes plastic. Once the material becomes plastic, obviously you will require less force to cut the part, to remove the material, right? And once your force reduces, you expand or you spend less energy to cut material. When you're going to spend less energy, you obviously are going to produce less heat. And because you produce less heat, the temperature goes down. See, it's, it's, this explanation is as simple as that. And once the temperature goes down, the process goes in a, into an equilibrium where the temperature is always kept down because this process is continuously repeating itself. Okay, so it goes into some sort of an equilibrium where the edge temperature then falls down or it goes down. So tomorrow somebody asks. Really need to 
use anything to result from these lubricating material. The other important thing is the cooling design. Okay, so first of all, categorize the material sticky and non sticky, and air for non sticky. The other thing, cutting tool. What should you use? Sharp corner tool? Should you use radius end or should you use chamfer tool? Okay, I will explain to you which of them makes what difference to when you're cutting these parts. Tool holding, like I, uh, like I explained to you. Right, the tool holding basically whether to use collet, whether to use hydro grip, or whether to use power chuck. The question, what what do we use? I'll come to that again. Work holding, mechanical, hydraulic, or holding fixture. I I think I made this amply clear in my first slide. The cooling, now I would like to spend some time here because this actually plays a very important role when you're doing, uh, when you're cutting in corner and titanium, okay? You must use high pressure. You can't use, oh, let me make a drawing again. If you notice that this is our workpiece, and this is our cooling pipe, okay? You'll notice that there are some machines where this is how the coolant falls. It's as if like somebody is forcing the coolant to, okay, please fall on the tube. This kind of coolant is a big no. You're going to ruin your cutting. Your tools are going to break straight away. So don't even attempt to cut with coolings like this. The pressure that you need to maintain when you're using a fluid coolant is at least 40 bar, if not less. Okay? 40 bar or beyond. The other very important thing that you need to do is to figure out how many sides you need to hit the tool from. Norm here is four sides at least. So you need to have the coolant pipe placed at four, four sides. If that is not possible, ask your customer to buy this ring. These are basically modular. They're available on the web. You can buy them and connect them and make a ring and make these hit the tool at the right place. So you can have eight or nine or ten different directions and hit the tool exactly at that point. So the ring cooling design is something essential for machining such materials. The other thing is what kind of a coolant are you supposed to use when you're using specially ion machine? Some tests have indicated that about 8% concentration in demineralized water works the best. Okay, there are some tests that have been done with 5% concentration, 8% concentration, and 10% concentration. The one with 8% concentration gave extremely good to a life, beyond 50% more than what was recommended. So we recommend about 8% concentration in demineralized water. Now this is our recommendation. Probably in your country, depending on the type of water that is available, you will have to ask the customer to get in touch with the cooling guys, the lubrication people, and get a suggestion from them. The general guideline is about 8%. Okay. The tool there are two possibilities of using a tool in cutting titanium or in color. The first one is either to use a radius tool or use a tool with a chamfer. The tool with sharp corners is a big no because in sharp corners, the force that is acting on the tool on a very small area is tremendous. So you'll see that during the phase of ramping itself, 
the tool will chip off, the edge will chip off. So please do not use sharp end gutters for roughing. Okay? You can use them for finishing, but don't use it for roughing. With Sandvik has done some experiment and they found out that tools with corner radius give a much better tool life than tools with chamfer. So this has also been our experience that you need to have a tool with a corner radius. Okay, how much corner radius? I would say the bigger the measure. For example, if you're using a 16 a bullnose tool, a solid carbide, I would say minimum of 3R or corner radius of R3 and beyond. R4, R5. Because what happens is you get a much strong cutting edge when you're using the corner radius. So the end is very strong. It can ramp, it can hold the cutting edge for a much longer time. The other very important thing is to push the cutting tool vendor to give you a honed tool. Now what is honing? Honing is actually a process that is generally done in some places manually. The operator takes out the tool and he has a diamond file and he lightly creates a, a fine radius on the cutting edge. It could be about 10 or 20 microns. Under microscope, this, this edge is honed and you get a nice radius. Why? It's because we do not want to keep the edge sharp when you're cutting such tough material. Because so again, the same principle of the bottom. The force acting on the edge is tremendous. And if it's very sharp, that means the area is very small, you, it chips off. And once one chipping in sets in, that's it. It's like a chain reaction. The entire tool gets chipped out. Okay? So, tool, please use a corner radius. Tool holding, I said call it is a big no. You have to use hydro grip or you have to use power chuck because not only do they give you rigid tool holding, but they also eliminate the possibility of run out unless your spindle is completely gone. Otherwise, the holding eliminates completely the run out. And Sandwich says that for every 10 microns in added run out, your tool life reduces by 50%. It's true because it vibrates. You can imagine at an RPM of let's say 5, 6,000, a 10 micron run out can be catastrophic for the tool. It can just shatter into pieces. So, tool holding, very important. Hydro grip or power chuck or if none of them available, shrink fit is the last option. Now this is something that we come back again to iron machining and that is the feed rate control in the corners. Everybody has looked at this particular uh, uh, thing in the uh, in iron machining. Towards the end in the motion control you get this. It's called as a constant chip thickness control for arcs. Now I would say how do I explain this to you, to you or to a customer? Let's assume that you have a, you are riding on a motorbike and you would like to make a 90 degree turn, okay? And let's say you're carrying, uh, oh, for example, is the merry-go-round. Imagine you're sitting on the merry-go-round and the merry-go-round starts spinning. What happens to the to the person who's sitting at completely at the edge of the merry-go-round? In order for him to to uh, complete a very small distance, he actually has to go much faster than the person sitting towards the center of the merry-go-round. The principle is the same here. What happens in eye machining is, in order for it to traverse over a corner, the peripheral field increases dramatically. Now what happens when you increase the field dramatically? Your chip thickness becomes higher the chip thickness increases because you have a much higher feed rate for at the periphery. So you are removing a much thicker chip than what is happening at the center because all our feed rates are based on the center of the tool. By adjusting the constant chip thickness, in fact, if you keep it at 100, it will do nothing. It will just increase the peripheral feed because the feed is anyway managed by the center of the tool. So your peripheral feed will be very high you will have variation in chip thickness coming in the corner. 
But if you keep it at zero, if you keep that thing here, what you're basically doing is you are calculating the peripheral speed and you're trying to keep the peripheral speed the same as what it was when it's going on a straight line. So whatever was the feed here, you're trying to maintain a similar feed on the, the periphery when you're on the corner. Thereby, it keeps the chip thickness constant even when it's going into the uh, in, into the corner. So if you're cutting softer materials, you can perhaps go with this situation. But if you're cutting tough materials, please do not go with this solution. You need to go with this solution. That means you need to push this down to 60 or 40 or below, depending on on uh, the kind of cut that I'm assuming is taking up. Okay. Ah, I'm sorry. It's exactly the opposite. For hard materials, it must be 100. For softer materials, you can still go down to zero. This is what uh, zero will do, and this is what 100 will do. I'm sorry, it's exactly the opposite. It's confused. All right. The other thing that you need to find out is the machinability of the material. Okay. Now, let's go into the software. We had enough of uh, the... Uh, presentation. So I have uh, okay. I have this part. Now let's do some settings for this part before we begin uh, I am shift. Okay. The first thing is let's look at what machine we are we have here. We have uh, a micron, twenty thousand RPM, fifteen thousand feed rate, fifteen kilowatt spindle. And the efficiency you can see there are two efficiencies here, seventy five and ninety. However, if you're using a direct drive, you can actually type in your efficiency. Your efficiency can be 95%. So if you're using a direct drive, please key in 95%. Okay. There's something here called an ACP tolerance. I'll come to this once I show you the wizard. Let's save and exit. Okay, for our sake today, I've taken a 16 mm CRFI so that the calculations can be much faster because it's pretty complex part. Let's select OK. Now, now this is from the programmer's point of view. This has got nothing to do with super alloys, the point that I'm going to speak now. I have seen in many cases that when the programming is done, a programmer does not want to use his brain. He says, OK, we have a 3D. Let's start immediately with 3D. Don't do that. Show uh, show some value to programming. What would that value be? For example, I just edit this part, and I'll go into draft angle analysis. I check the draft on the part. Okay, the draft of the part tells me that there are several places that are having straight lines or zero draft straight walls. So why should I actually use I machine in 3D here? So the question that you'll ask me is why not? I machining is also for prismatic path. And 3D is also for prismatic path. My answer is yes, it's for prismatic paths, but you have to understand that there's a difference in the internal engine between I machining 3D and 2D. 3D will start looking out for scallops. Okay, so this is where it will start spending time. Even if it's a straight part, it will start looking that whether this wall is meeting the scallop that you have defined. Now we know that it's a straight wall. We are not going to have scallops. So let's not trouble eye machining 3D. In areas that you want to remove bulk material, quickly switch immediately to eye machining 2D. It's faster, it will give you much better results. Okay, so let me add. Uh, milling 2D I machining. Okay. And I already have got some contour. If it's three, let me check it. Yes. So I have marked this area, this region, as my first region to remove material. Okay. Let's pick the tool. 
going to pick the 16. Now remember that I told you that your corner radius has to be bigger. Okay, three is what I consider to be the minimum norm. You can go R4 or R5, but three is what I consider uh, very comfortable in cutting. So 16 R3, but please. If a cut, cutting manufacturer pushes 16 R.5, 0 0.8, or even R1, don't fall for it. Ask him to give you a bigger tool, a bigger corner radius tool. Because you can anyway remove that remaining radius later on in finishing. But for roughing, let's have a strong base. So I'm going to use this tool, and you can see that it's only 60 millimeters out of older. And I'll pick my level. You can see that this level is at 70, so my tool is, or rather cannot go all the way to 70. I'll accept this and I will add plus 15. So I'll stop it at 55 millimeters straight away. I will not allow it to go beyond. Okay, and the technology wizard, level 6. Now, all of us know something out here. Starting from, I think, last uh, version and a half, iMachining started making its own intelligent step downs. Because earlier, it used to take whatever was available as the cutting length. If my cutting length was 35, and if I had to go 55, it would have done 35, and remaining, whatever was remaining, the next step of cut. But starting, starting a version or so, one version back or so, we realize that iMachining has been doing this intelligent calculations, and it's trying to get the uh, the range in either yellow or green. Very rarely you see that the range goes in in uh, in red. In this case, you can see that it's going to use two cuts of 27.5, generating the actual contact point of 2.7. Okay, now. This particular thing, let me save it, and let me push this up, and put this below I'm showing 2D. Okay. This ACB has got straight away its relation out here. The percentage. Okay. So what does it say? It says that the tolerance for determining if the distance from a given ACP is considered acceptable or not. So let me change it to 10% and see what happens back in our, our uh, defined process. Let me edit. Yes, please. It's still putting it in 2.7 because there's no way that it can change it. Now, the norm in using iMachining is that you need to go closer to the whole number. One, two, three, four, so on. Why? Why do we need, and why is it more essential when you're cutting with iMachining, uh, or when you're cutting hard materials, that you need to have your ACP close to your whole number? Again, let me open paint. I need to explain this. This is very important, especially considering the fact that you are going to cut hard materials. So let's say this is the wall, and this is the horizontal area. Okay. Now I have my tool out here. The red color. Let me make tool. Okay. Size. So. This is my tool, and my tool, of course, has a diameter, and it has got the flutes with a typical helix angle, okay? Now, what is ACP? ACP is basically the contact points the tool is making with the wall of the material. So in this case, what is the ACP we have here? It's 2.7, which means two whole points and a 0.7 point somewhere here, which is not exactly on the helix, but somewhere in air that is in contact with the material. So it's 2.7. Why 
why are we so interested with this? Or why are we so infatuated with such a number? It's simple, because there's a science behind it. Each time a point is in contact, a whole number is in contact, the force is acting only in one direction. Okay? The force is acting only in one direction. In the but the moment this point 7 comes into picture, which is a floating point, it's not on the helix, but it's floating. The force can be anywhere, or it keeps changing itself. <clears throat> now, what happens when you have force that is changing itself? The cut is not stable, or the tool is not stable, because there's one point that's causing all this instability or imbalance. What happens when you have an imbalance? When you have imbalance, you induce vibration. Okay, there's vibration. When you, when, you, uh, <clears throat> when you look at your car or scooter, if there is a part that is, that is not stable, that is not uh, balanced, it starts giving vibrations. You can take your car tires. They have to be balanced. So the same way, when you have a point in air, it is, it is the point that is creating imbalance, and imbalance creates vibration, and vibration creates chatter straight away. So that point is directly connected with the chatter that you're getting on your wall. So our general idea is that you must go close to a whole number as much as possible. How do we do that? There are two ways we, or there are three ways the whole number can be achieved. One, I can reduce my depth of cut. So what happens here? Instead of 50, I make uh, 25. I'm still 2.2, okay? Now, 2.2 is still not acceptable. Why? Even if I make this at, let's say, 30, let's see what happens here. It's 2. You can see that the moment I change my depth of cut, I get two whole numbers. That means I'm having a stable cut, but now this depth of cut is going to be only 40 millimeters and not 55. So my first influencer in the ACP is the depth itself. Okay, so let's go back again, change this to 15. The other influencer here is my helix angle. So if I <coughs> go to I data, and if I change it to 35 degrees, let's see what happens here. You can see immediately my, my ACP changed. 1.9, coming very close to the whole number. Good enough, because I have said that up to 10%, it can be, it is acceptable. So 1.9 comes very nicely in my ACP. So I can now be sure that I've got a very small chance of vibration or chatter. Now this plays a crucial role when you're cutting inkerman or titanium because a small vibration of chatter is enough to knock out your tool. Okay, because first of all your tool is in a high heat stress and on top of that there is a vibration. It can easily knock the tool off. It can break the tool, it can chip the tool off. So it's important that you come close to this ACP. Okay, let's save this and calculate this tool path. Okay, you can see that I've got two depths, 27.5 millimeter each. Could have absolutely low vibrations or very low vibrations, which is good enough. One of the other things that you need to take care of, <clears throat> the other thing that you need to take care of in the technology wizard is you need to keep your eye on the power requirement. Machine tool people, when they tell you the spindle life is basically when the tool is loaded or the spindle is loaded at a certain level. The general acceptable loading of the spindle to give you extremely good spindle life is about 70%. So, you have to have your spindle load close to 70% within the range of 70 or below 70. Currently, it's <clears throat> even less than 50%, so it's, it's very good, okay? Now, let's assume uh, a scenario when you want to use level 8 turbo, but you also don't want to exceed 70%, okay? Because when you use turbo, in 99% of the time, it tends to use 100% of what is available on your spindle. So 100% is loaded. 
which is not a great scenario when you're cutting hard materials because here the cutting times could end up being a bit higher than what you would have for steel. In such cases, or and what I'm telling you is only in such cases, this is a trick. Okay? In such cases, we can cheat the software and say we actually don't have 15 kilowatt. Okay? What 72 is of 15 kilowatt? 15 into 0 0.7, that's about 10.5. So you can tell the machine or to I machine, I only have 10 kilowatt. Okay? And then push the turbo button. So what you will, what it will do is it will only use 10 kilowatt. You are within the 70 percent range, and it will give you a very fast machine if you want to use turbo. And this is we have done. This, this trick has already been been done, and it works very nice. So use this trick when you want to cut hard materials. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so we have done the first machining. Now let's go to the other side. We have this area here, there are two pockets that need eye machining. So I'll just copy this operation, paste it, let me edit this function, and I'll go to the geometry and I'll see what's the next geometry. Okay, that's geometry number four is already available. Yeah. I'm going to use contour four. The tool is the same, I'm not going to do change. The pocket depth, however, is 35. Now, if I use 35 as a zero, you will see that I again go into the yellow range. Yellow is like there are going to be some vibrations, but not, not damaging vibrations. There are going to be certain vibrations. You're going to have some chatter. Okay. That's good enough. What about power? Just 3.6 kilowatt. We are very much within the uh, needs or within the uh, spindle requirements. Let's calculate. The calculation is pretty quick, and so is the tool path. So we have had two things. Let's paste and handle the other area here. So I'm going to go to the geometry. I think it's come from one to five. Yes, it is come to five. Let's take tool and I'm going to change the tool now. We're going to use a 12R1 bold nose tool. Let's select it. Okay, my upper level is this point and my pocket depth is up here. Okay, zero. Again, 1.3, that's okay. Let's save and calculate. Perfect. So I have got one, two, and three. I am machining to the two parts. Now, if I run the simulation of these three, you realize that bulk of this cutting has been done by I machining to the two without having to worry about the scallops and all. 12 minutes, I have this scooped up. Now what remains, of course, cannot be done with I machining 2D because the walls are having a draft, so I have to use I machining 3D. So let's use I machining 3D. I have a template that is already stored, so I'm going to add the template I machining 3 one. Yeah, this one. Okay. Geometry is target. Two levels. That's it. Okay. And what I am going to do here is because I am machining 3D uses the concept of scalar. So sometimes it can actually increase your machining time more than your expectation, not the customer's expectation because you're comparing it now with I machining 2D, so your expectation is up, oh, I need to have a uh, smaller time. Go back into the machining conditions, and this is what I was talking about. We used a level 4 turbo, okay? You can look at what is happening here. It's 15 kilowatt. Not a great scenario, because you've got to use 100% of your available machine uh, spindle load, 
Okay, so this is where I would advise you to use the trick that I just showed you, or you could do another thing. Let's ask if my machine can keep it 10 kilowatt. It can. Okay, so the moment I change my 10 kilowatt, you can look what happens here. It changes everything. It changes all the parameters by itself to ensure that you have got 10 kilowatt. However, I would really not suggest this again. Okay? I would still go ask you to go back to that method of putting a lower value of the spindle load and then push it to the bottom. So that you stay within the range. Because sometimes you could forget pushing this button. Okay? So let me save this. Let's, for sake of today's uh, uh, calculation, let's keep it at 100%. The other important thing when you're cutting the time machine in 3D, okay, and when you're roughing it out, is if you've kept a good wall offset for your next operations, don't use such a tight tolerance for calculation. It pushes up your calculation time, also the machining time. So one-fifth of the offset should be your tolerance. That's my thumb rule. Okay. That's done. Your arc size has to be D by 2 or R. That's about 8 millimeters. We're using a 16 millimeter tool, so it's about 8 millimeters. All right, let's save this and run the calculation. It will take some time. And while it is calculating, let's look at what this machinability of the material means. Although I have shown this before, but it's very important to understand why this becomes even more important when you're trying to machine tough materials. <clears throat> machinability basically is a term that indicates how a work material responds to the cutting process. Whether it is easy, whether it's difficult, that's what machinability is all about. Mathematically, there's a formula, but honestly, nobody would refer to the formula. It just says that machinability indexes the cutting speed for the target material that ensures a uh, tool life of 60 minutes divided by cutting speed of a reference material which already has a tool life of 60 minutes. So if you have this thing ready with you, you can calculate the machine. For example, the AISI 1212, the reference material has a machinability index of 1. Okay? Now you can use this reference to calculate the machinability of titanium. You could use this to calculate Inconel's machinability or you could use it to calculate stainless steel's machinability. It's simple. You just have to take, now these are theoretical values. You have to take the tool life of 16 minutes. What is that cutting speed that will give you a tool life 60 minutes, let's say for SS302, and that tool life is, uh, the cutting speed is 0.23 meters per second. So you take 0.23 meters per second, divide it by 0.5, because 0.5 was the cutting speed that was used to cut the triple one to steel to generate a uh, life of 60 minutes. So 0.23 divided by 0.4 is 0.46, which is lower than 1 which means that SS302 is more difficult to cut than AISI 1212. That's how we determine the machinability index. But honestly, we just don't care about what the theoretical value says. We would like to find out the machinability of a material. Why is the machinability important? The machinability is important because of several things. First of all, we would like to improve your tool life. Excuse me, but I'll have to drink some water. Why did the machinability come up all of a sudden? If you notice in I machining, when we define the materials, let's go back. I hope this is calculated. It's done the calculation, so I'll explain it to you in a bit. Okay, why is this important? If you go into the material definition, 
you notice that when we add a new material, let's say in Kernel 718, all it asks us is the ultimate tensile strength. It's about 1375 for in Kernel 718. Now, the ultimate tensile strength of in Kernel 1375, the ultimate tensile strength of an impact bowler 48 HRC is also about 1360. But an impact bowler 2 steel is much more easier to cut than in Kernel 718. So what does this tell us? It tells us that perhaps the tensile strength is really not the final word in determining the machinability of a material. Okay? And that is the reason why we at Solid Can came up with this machinability factor that not just defining UTS, but we also need to find out that machinability factor that differentiates an Incoil 718 against an Apex Polar with 48 HRC. So what we're going to do now is to understand the machinability factor. Okay? So it's important because it improves tool life dramatically because if you're going to put in kernel 718 and calculate, you perhaps can use the same toolpath to cut steel which is having a similar uh, tensile strength. But you know, you know that it will cut easily steel or it will not do the vice or versa because if you put the tensile strength of the steel and try to cut in kernel, you're going to have bits and pieces of your tool already. So first of all, it improves tool life dramatically because you are providing to iMachining a very accurate representation of the material. Okay? It helps iMachining to determine exact cutting conditions, much better surface quality because the conditions are right. If you're doing large parts on aluminum, it reduces the chances of warpage because you're using exact conditions. That means your stress involved is much lower and your overall process is improved. So the factors that affect machinability in real world conditions. Why do we need this? Why can't we simply mistake? I just give you an example of 718 and bowler. Now that, that's an extreme example. The other example could be that I'm trying to cut steel, but I'm not getting tool life. My customer picks up the phone and starts complaining to me about I have suggested, you suggested 1,100. This is something that came to me from the material supplier, but I'm not getting the tool life. We have this, and that's how we came up with this whole thing of machinability and stuff like that. We went there, the test chart of that material said 1,100. Then Mickey, Mickey suggested us to do some tests. And with that test we came up, we realized that the material was much more tougher than what was UTS was suggesting. And then we, we brought down the machinability factor, and that's how the tool life was improved. So, a lot of things influence the machinability in real-world conditions. The basic nature of the material, the grain structure, the micro strength, mechanical strength, hardness, work hardenability, conductivity. So, there are many such factors that influence machinability of the material. How do we determine it? It's very simple. You tell your customer that you would like to have a sample piece from that particular batch. Now I'm going to stress on the word batch because when a material supplier supplies material to a customer, he takes a big villain and cuts material from that place or bar and give it, gives it to the customer. So that becomes one batch of material because if he changes the billet, the batch changes. So as long as you have those batch, let's say from that billet, he cut 200 blocks and gave it to the customer. So you say, please, give me a small piece. I would like to run a test to determine the machinability of this material. So in this case, what we have is we have a part which is 175 by 15. And we have generated the small step here in SolidWorks. The step can be about 10 millimeters. So that's all that we want to cut. And this is 24, but you did not cut 24, which I'm going to explain to you. You did not cut 24. And this machine has 10 kilowatt spindle power. What we do is we ask the customer, okay, here's 
a test chart or we just go to MatWeb and find out what is the ultimate temporal strength of this material. Put that over here, keep the machine ability factor at zero. And we generate a program at level eight, not turbo, but level eight. Okay, why is it done at level eight? Because we would like to note down what is the power that is being generated by I machine, the spindle power that it is calculated. Because we we're going to compare this power with the actual current. Now, it's also very important that we maintain a good ACP so that we don't want the vibration of the chatter to influence the readings on the control. So you did not go at 24. You go at a depth that will ensure that you get a whole number. So in this case, 19 millimeters gave us a whole number. So we did at 19. We note down these values. Okay, Just take an image and keep it aside. What is important here is note down that it is giving me 5.2 kilowatts out of 10 kilowatts, which is 52% load on the spindle. Fair enough. Generate the program, take the G code, go down to the shop floor, <coughs> mount the part, put the tool, <coughs> sorry, and start cutting. Once it starts cutting, leave the first two parts, because generally you can have material variations, leave the first two passes, so when your observation. After it finishes the second part, start noting down the reading shown on the <coughs> spindle load uh, meter. In our case, the spindle load was being shown at 6 kilowatt. 60% was loaded, so it's 6 kilowatt. Fair enough. Let the cut finish. Remove the part, remove the tool. The machine is there. So let them do whatever they want. Come back to our software. So we noticed that it was 60% or 6 kilowatt, whereas I machining has generated a value of 5.2 or 52%, which means that the material done on the shop floor is much tougher, or it's tougher than what the UTS is suggesting, right? Now, if you had run the same thing on production, using 52 as your reference, you would obviously get a much lower tool life. Your complaints would start. You're not getting tool life. The tools are getting blunt faster. That's the reason because you have generated 5.2 here, whereas on the machine it's showing as 60, which means that it's tougher. So what do you do? You go back and push the machinability factor down. Negative means the material is tougher. Positive means the material is easier to cut. So we push it, let's say, at minus 16 percent. You could put it at minus 10, check, minus 12, check minus 16, go back into the modify cutting conditions and from the image that you have captured where you have had the chip thickness and otherwise, you put the maximum chip thickness that was there, the maximum VC and the maximum cutting angle. Once these three are same as that, look at what the power comes up. And if this is the value that is gone, is the same as what you got on the machine, then you have to determine extremely accurately the machinability factor of this materials, which is basically minus 16 percent. You can store this. You know, we have not changed the UTS, remember. The UTS still remains the same, but the machinability has changed. It's a, it's a tougher material, so you store that material and now you can use that machinability factor and generate all your tool parts it will improve not only your tool life, but even your cutting uh, process itself will be improved. You will get more parts per the same tool. Okay? And this is really, really very important when you're cutting titanium and coma because a small difference in the UTS values can make a major impact on the tool life. Right? So it's very important that you measure you measure the machinability of the part of the material. Right, so we have done our calculation. You have three tool paths in iMachining 2D and one tool path in iMachining 3D. Okay, so let's run the simulation of this. <coughs> and let's run two. Samples would take about 
half an hour or so. Right, that's about 32 minutes. If I had put the whole process in iMachine in 3D, I perhaps would have had more than 50 minutes. So I did a smart thing. I said, okay, there are several straight walls here. Let's, uh, let's, let's make a uh, few iMachine in 2D tool parts and let's create iMachine in 3D. Now, this actually has got nothing to do with internal machining, but this is a general information that I'm providing to you that when you have paths which have got a lot of straight walls and also walls with uh, draft, you try and isolate and see if I can use high machining 2D because it's very fast. And then the areas that you can't apply high machining 2D, just apply high machining 3D. Your entire process, is, the cycle time comes down at least by another 10, 15 percent. Right. Now what happens to the other area that is still remaining? Of course, we stop eye machining here, and then I start using the HSR machining. Now, the best part of using a combination of eye machining and HSR is that the stock is passed on from eye machining back to HSR easily. For example, since I'm using a, a five-axis machine, I can machine it from this side because I can actually use a shorter tool. This is hardly 34 millimeters. So I can go from this side and the remaining areas I could machine from this side. So what I have generated is I have generated uh, another toolpath here, uh, a rest roughing toolpath with HSR and that's coming from a different side altogether. Okay, that should be pretty quick. It should not take much time. The stock is now passed from I am shipping 3D to HSR. Now, the general guideline here is because we are out of our highway, we are back to our regular road of HSM, so the parameters are not going to be calculated by anybody, but we have to do it. We can always use the guideline of what I am shipping is throwing out. If they, if we may not use it exactly. We could take the eye machining parameters guideline and I would say use the level 4 guideline of the level 6, uh, level 8. Use the level 4 guideline, check with the, with the cutting tool vendor what he is he suggesting and arrive at your own bit of parameters which is more inclined towards the eye machining parameters of level 4. All right, so we have done rest roughing from this side. We have two more rest roughings out here. Uh, this is basically from this position, from this position and one for this position out here. So let's calculate quickly and I'll move to the simulation. Let's calculate. Okay, the calculation has been done, so we have two parts of rest roughing from here and also from the side. Okay, now something off track, because it's not going to be related to my machine that I'm going to talk. Several times I've heard from people about uh, uh, the simulation and verification not being ac accurate enough fast enough and uh, uh, they have problems in simulation. Now I'm speaking because I think this is the right time to touch that area. What you can actually do is you can actually use your machine simulation if you have one. So I put the simulation, machine simulation. Okay, now you will say that I have a three axis post process. Okay. Uh, this was a five-axis machine, but 
I have a three-axis post processor. I don't have machine simulation and stuff like that. I need to create machine simulation. After this machine simulation is over, I'll show you. I'll show you a small trick. You can use that. If you could actually end up creating a machine simulation or a machine to run the simulation in less than a second. Okay. Sorry. Right. Let's run the simulation. I want to show you some things in this. That's the reason I'm running this simulation. Mm -hmm. We want to switch off what well, piece is already off. Yeah. So let's run the simulation. The best part of such simulation is that you can actually speed up the simulation. Because that's 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 a complaint from users is that the simulation speed is slow, I can't run it. So you can see that here I can actually change my simulation speed. And this simulation is much faster than our regular simulation. So I advise you that if you have or if your customer has a machine simulation option uh, with them, please use machine simulations uh, simulator. It's really very powerful. And I'll show you some other functions within this that makes it even more powerful. The machine is, the simulation is over. So what I was going to show you was, once the simulation is over, okay, let's move this thing up. The best part in, in, in machine simulation is its ability to analyze or find the deviation between a CAD part, that's your CAD model, and the machine stock. And trust me, it's really very accurate. In 2016, you can see that there's a new function. It is automatically improving the quality in the background. That means the quality of my finished model dramatically improves once the simulation stops or I pause the simulation. But this is happening in the background without affecting the main process. Okay? So this is the new thing in 2016 in machine simulation. So what I have is I can go into the verification and I can ask for the gouge or excess report. Go into the analysis and I can ask for the deviation here and I refresh this. You can see that, oh sorry. Minimum is minus 0 0.8 and the maximum is also plus 0 0.8. Okay, and let's refresh it. You can see that it generates a band of colors for you, telling you how much is the deviation. Now, <clears throat> these things can be changed by you. For example, you don't want nine, but I want only five. Okay, let's refresh it. So I get only five variations. And the best part, you can actually go into the uh, area, 
See, the moment I've zoomed in, machine simulation is running the automatic quality improvement in the view area. So it's trying to improve the uh, area, the uh, visualization. It's, it's making it much more accurate. But it doesn't stop me from continuing my process. So what I can do is simply use the middle mouse button and click wherever I want. Using the middle mouse button, I can click on a wall. Not in the analysis. Okay. I click on the box and it gives me an information about the point, but I'm not interested in the position. But what I'm interested in is in the deviation. I immediately get what is the deviation between the stock and the part. Very important aspect when you're, uh, especially when you're doing large parts and you'd like to see where the problem is. You can zoom into that area. Solid cam will improve the area further. And you can actually go click on the area and it will tell you what is the deviation between the CAD model and the stock repair. Okay? So please, if the customer has it, push him to use the machine simulations uh, uh, simulator to show the cutting uh, simulation. If you're doing a demo, please show this part. All right. So we are done with our thing. And I told you that if you have, if you don't have the machine with you, and you would like to define a machine without having to go into the hassle of defining each and every aspect, you can actually go to uh, registry edit, current user software, and look for solid cam 2016. And in the cam experimental mode, please switch on this. Or if you don't have it, define a new D word, uh, new registry key, super Mac ID editor. Okay, the word capital small is important here. S is capital, M is capital, I is capital, D is capital, E is capital. Super Mac ID editor, and change the registry value to one. Once that is done, reload back solid cam. Double click your machine. Right click on your on the machine and you can straight away export the entire VMID to a machine straight away. Okay, just ensure that here you have got nothing, so keep it blank. Right click, export to machine simulation. So in a click, it will create the machines ready for you to simulate. Of course, it will not have any uh, bed or anything, but it is ready now. You can take your part straight away and run the simulation inside your machine simulation. So use this method to generate your own machine simulations. All right, that was off part. Let's see another part. Uh, in this case, it's, a, it's an SSPH 17-4. So this is a very interesting part. So I'm going to munch on this kids. An interesting story here is this customer of ours wanted to uh, buy a machine, or rather he's still in the process of buying a machine, and he wanted to know the cutting time for this part. And the size is 250, 64, cutting area is 31, and the total height is 35 or 36. What is the material? The material is SSPS 17-4. You can look at the UTS. It's almost close to your insulin. This was sent to several machine tool vendors to come up with time. The lease was three hours that they got for this part. But this customer was uh, certain that anything above one hour, they're going to lose time, or they're going to lose money on this part. It doesn't make sense. But this was too huge an order to leave, too huge a business to leave. So 
this customer already has eye machining, so they re-estimated with eye machining. First of all, you look at the curvature. This is about 0.5 R, and I I made it very clear in the beginning that when you're roughing, try to use a bigger corner radius tool. Okay. So what we have here is we have got outer eye machining, which was done, and then because of uh, this slope, remove this much before we remove the pocket. So there was this eye machining 3D that was done to create that slope. Okay, but the best part was here: one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's edit one of these two parts and see what it is. Level six, okay. So I think that the level six turbo. Yes. So this no. Okay, this is what was attempted. Level 6 turbo and we brought down the engagement angle. It was 55, we brought it to 20. Okay, 31 millimeters cutting depth. Look at the parameters. 6000 RPM. 11.6 meters per minute feed rate, minimum engagement 0.48, maximum engagement 0.48, and a minimum engagement of 0.2. Of course, it is going to pull all 15 kilowatts, but what's important here is to see how much time it takes. It takes only 44 seconds to open this pocket on a stainless steel PS17 4. Of course, the initial reaction of the machine to the vendor was that this is impossible. 44 seconds for this pocket is just not possible. And the same apprehension expressed by the cutting tool people. But when we ran this part, both the uh, cutting tool vendor and the machine tool vendor's eyes popped out because in 45 seconds the machining was done. And they took out the tool and they studied the tool to see if any damage had been done on the tool. Nothing. And this whole part actually was cut using same 11.6 uh, uh, 11 uh, meters per minute. And the entire roughing was done in 17.5 minutes. Whereas the customer was expecting it about an hour. And the best time that he had got from the machine tool vendor was three hours. So you can look at what happens when you get everything right. Okay? When I mean everything right, it means fluid coolant, eight percent concentration, cutting tool, the geometry, hold the edges, corner radius, no chamfer or sharp corner, tool holding. Hydro grip or power chuck. Work holding hydraulic wise. Good control. So when you get things right, you can actually cut any part. You have to only remember what I told you today about holding, tool holding, work holding, fluid coolant, the concentration, and of course the tweaks within eye machining to get your exact tool path to make sure that you don't you end up cutting the material effectively. Don't forget to run the test to determine the machinability of the material. It's very important. It's something that's often ignored, but trust me, for 
staff materials for N-kernel for titanium for stainless steel, don't ignore this fact that the machinability is very important. You have to determine it for batch. If the batch changes, run the test again to determine the machinability of the material. Adjust the machinability and trust me, you will always end up doing much better job than probably the cutting tool vendors would, would, would think that the cutters would do. For example, the tool of, uh, uh, I'll show you some examples that we did where, uh, yeah, this one. This was a part that was done uh, on Incon 718 on a Herco BMX 50. I machining 3D roughing. The VC that came up with I machining 3D of level 4 was 81, whereas the maximum is cast was 25. So almost double. Tool life estimated was 26 minutes. Our tool life was 86 minutes. So we can imagine what things can I machining do when you're doing, uh, when you're cutting such materials. Now, if you follow the guidelines that I have shown today, I have given today to you about what to do, what things to take care of, I see no reason for you to come back to me and say, oh, we're cutting an incolent material, I need your help. You might need some help in tweaking something, but generally, you should be confident enough today to go and cut parts. Trust me, none of your competitors would attempt to cut these parts using their high performance uh, system that you have. But today you can be confident that I machine with I machining you can cut any tough material in the world, including tungsten carbide. Remember, we have also cut tungsten carbide with I machining. So I machining is a system that's now ready for you to take on any kind of material, any kind of challenge for cutting. Right, so uh, I come to the end of our webinar and uh, if you have questions, I'll be more than glad to take your questions. Amod, thank you very much. Uh, very, very uh, good webinar. And of course, we have many requests uh, of sharing uh, uh, with our resellers uh, the parts wow. you use for this webinar, of course, this uh, amazing presentation. And uh, thank yeah. you very much, Amod, really good webinar. Now you can thank go you for your lunch. You did okay. a very good walk. Thank you very much and see all of our resellers next week. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.